Hi, I'm Dr. Abraham Weisfeld, and you're listening to Catholic vs. Jew. If you could just tell the listeners a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you believe, and how you came to believe it. Okay. I was born to uh, two uh, Jewish parents from Poland who were refugees. I'm a second-generation Holocaust survivor, and I was raised in the Yiddish language as an Orthodox Jewish person. And nowadays, I call myself a Orthodox Jewish agnostic. So that's where I am, and that's where I come from. Were you raised with religion and belief in God, and did you pray as a child before meals and at night? Oh, I was raised Orthodox. You know, I went to uh, Cheder, Talmud Torah school in the evenings. You know, after the Protestant school in the afternoons, I went to uh, evening school for two hours. And we translated the uh, Torah from Hebrew into English, you know, sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph, day after day, year after year. So I was, uh, I did my bar mitzvah, you know, in both the uh, Hebrew and the uh, Aramaic as well. I sang my half Torah. Did you believe in God at an early age? Oh, yes, of course. You know, even though we never spoke about God anymore, you know, because it was not an appropriate subject, you know, for Holocaust survivors to be discussing because one could not sort of uh, accommodate God within the context of our living experience. And so, uh, you know, to avoid the question of um, the responsibility of God or the non-responsibility of God, you know, the Holocaust, we avoided talking about God. And this is, you know, Orthodox Jewish, you know, tradition in any case, you know, you don't talk about God because, you know, you take you don't take God's name in vain. You don't talk about Hashem, as he's called, for no good reason. Now, how old are you today, if you don't mind my asking? Oh, I'm 69 years old now. If you compare your faith in God from when you were very young until today, did it go up and down or was it constantly the same? Well, you know, uh, we were very constrained, you know, like very sort of rigid, you know, conception of, of religion. So, it was said, you know, that if uh, one changed from being a believer to a non-believer, then one would die. God would take a retribution on you. So when I met in high school a friend of mine who became a neurosurgeon, and he was an atheist, and he was Jewish, and he uh, pointed out that he was still alive, that's the first time I met an atheist, and, and so I had to sort of, you know, change in my conception to some degree. And I did. And then at the age of 14, under the influence of... Uh, the Einsteinian Revolution, which is actually an endeavor to explain what God is. In 1905, you know, when he came up with his theory, this uh, revolution caused a revolution in my own thinking as well, and I became more interested in physics and studying physics than I was in um, maintaining a religious, you know, perspective. So uh, I became uh, non-religious at that point. And I went on to study physics at the university, but then I changed to politics and did my PhD in political science at UCOM because uh, of the necessity, you know, of dealing with, you know, social issues and existence. So what do you think happens to you when you die? What's the best case scenario and what's the worst case scenario? Oh, 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 there's a big difference, you know, between Orthodox Judaism and Christianity, because in the way I was taught, you know, there was no paradise. There was no hell. When you died, you died. And that you have to follow the law. And then in Yom Kippur, you know, uh, after New Year's in September, you were supposed to regret all the uh, the laws that you had not kept, you know, and all the sins that you had committed, and you were supposed to take uh, common sense of them, and you were supposed to um, pray for forgiveness, basically, and then you would be inscribed in the, in the Book of Life for the coming year. And that was it. No paradise. Just the Book of Life at Yom Kippur. Okay, so there's an annihilation of your soul at death? Oh, yeah, there is a concept of a soul, but uh, the soul does not continue to exist, because the soul is considered to be a form of consciousness, I think. And then Freud you know, elaborated this into, you know, the various levels of the soul, which are described, you know, in the Torah as well, in which he developed a whole theory of um, consciousness and, and uh, subconsciousness, you know, it, alter ego, and the subconscious, you know, which became, you know, the more scientific expressions of what are to be found in terms of what is called the soul in Judaism. So, is it safe to say that today, right now, you believe that if you were to die, you would just be gone? Yes. There's no sort of soul which continues to exist as a ghost thereafter. Okay. And so, what motivation do you have to do the right thing, to be good? What What is the basis of your morality if there's no consequence whatsoever? Because of your respect, awe, and obedience to God as a slave. And you have to fear God, not only be a slave, but you have to fear God. Because 
You see, like at Yom Kippur, if you don't, you know, repent for your sins and you are not sincere in trying to follow the law of God, then you could be uh, not inscribed in the Book of Life for the coming year and you could die in the coming year. That's what the Orthodox Jews believe, but what do you believe? Well, <clears throat> for me, morality is a case of ethics. I make a distinction between morality, which are the, which is the law of, of God and uh, the retribution thereafter, and uh, ethics. Ethics has a logical foundation, but it's very close to morality, you know, because morality also has a logical foundation to it, but it is reinforced, you know, by the will of God. Ethics is reinforced by logic alone. And ethics, you know, an ethical approach to life and other humans and animals and the environment, etc., is a matter of logic. You know, like if you don't respect the life in general, then, you know, eventually all life will die. You know, it's as simple as that. But that's going to happen anyway, right? The universe will not sustain biological life indefinitely. Yes, the theory of thermodynamics by Maxwell, the law of entropy. So what is the basis of ethics, rationally speaking, if nothing we do has any lasting consequences and the, the universe is destined for the heat death? Well, life is its own rationale. If we are alive, and we are, then uh, we do with it what we can, and we enjoy it as we can, without uh, denying any of those rights you know, to any other person as well. In my doctoral thesis, I developed a principle of reciprocity, and that is that all the rights that we seek for ourselves can only be uh, accomplished in general and in a lasting manner, and for the maximum number of people, by a principle of reciprocity, that which we wish for ourselves, we must uh, recognize in others as well. The golden rule. The golden rule, yeah, which has, in all the religions, philosophies of the world, there's various expressions which repeat the same thing. But what would prevent someone from calculating a way to maximize his own personal pleasure and profit and luxury at the expense of others with low risk of, of ever being found out and going to his grave rich, happy, healthy, and fully satisfied in all of his animal lusts and desires. What would prevent him from doing that? Nothing. We have the example of Trump now in office, you know. do <laughs> <laughs> precisely that. You know, this is Machiavellian, you know, logic. And he's a very good Machiavellian, you know. And, and uh, narcissism, you know, is the principle of individualism that was a uh, perpetuated by Protestantism, that the divine will is trying to seek the best for the individual. And, and so uh, in order to uh, seek uh, success and prosperity in life, one must be uh, religious and, you know, uh, respect uh, God and follow the will of God, and then God will reward you with a prosperous and uh, etc. life. Plus paradise as well, you know. So how would you convince someone that believes that to come over to a more reciprocal point of view? Yeah, well, you know, once, you know, that the existence of God was dismissed by Nietzsche and morality fell uh, to the wayside, you know, as a result, uh, either one developed a theory of ethics or one just may do without any morality or any ethics, which is what Nietzscheism, you know, is all about, you know. In my podcast, I rarely talk about politics because I'm not interested, but I know that you're involved in the political sort of philosophy of the Middle East. So I'm going to make an exception for my podcast and I'm going to allow you to sort of elaborate on that. I find it boring because I don't understand it, but maybe you can break through my thick skull here and just talk in general terms so that the audience could understand what your life's work has been about. Well, empirically, what I've done is that now I go to live in uh, Palestine with the Palestinians in the city of Nablus. And the people who know me, you know, know that I'm Jewish, but they accept me and they welcome me, you know. So I, uh, by living there, I am demonstrating that, you know, the different religions and the different cultures and the national identities, as national identities, can live together, you know, uh, without, you know, violence, you know, that it is possible. And in fact, you know, even within, you know, uh, pre-67 Israel, in the cities of Akka, Yaffa, and Haifa, the populations are mixed, you know, half-half, you know, Jewish, you know, Muslim, Palestinian, and they're living together, you know, and it's quiet there. Then, you know, it's the most peaceful part of the countries, you know, those cities there. And it's in Jerusalem where the uh, government is trying to divide the population along what's called the separation principle, which one of the early Russian Zionist theoreticians called the uh, separation principle. When that is being implemented, it generates violence. 
in cultural terms, you know, I want ex can explain the political dynamics without getting boring and without getting lost. Is uh, saying that you know between peoples it is possible to live together, but when we talk about you know the political superstructures, the state structures that are established over peoples, then you get into trouble. You know because then you have the military, you have the power which corrupts, etc. And uh, you know by necessity people are going to have to change their orientation to how they see themselves you know, living you know, with their cultural identity and not depend upon you know an army to guarantee their security, but rather guarantee their security by mutually guaranteeing the security of those that you live with. When you have a mutual treaty of reciprocity, then uh, you have mutual security as well. Mm. So what have you learned about power and why does it make people hateful? Because uh, power allows those who, have, who hold the power, who control the power, to reap uh, tremendous advantages they find that the power enables them to create things that are beneficial for themselves so but we should use the wealth that we have in our generating to do things that uh, you know free university education for everybody because you know the robots are taking over and they're going to do all the work for us you know so what do we do with our lives you know we live we live and learn you know that's what we do with our lives are you a fan of Karl Marx's philosophy? or I, At first, I, I, I was enchanted with Marx, yes, and with uh, Trotsky, Leon Trotsky. Lev Bronstein is his Jewish name. But the problem is that both Marx and Trotsky were assimilationists. They were giving up on their own culture and calling themselves either German or Russian in order to hold a position of power because, you know, they wanted to have power within the state over a, a largely um, a Russian Christian population, and so it wasn't, you know, advantageous for Trotsky to proclaim that he's he's Jewish, you know, because he wouldn't get to keep his position of power. And uh, eventually, that was one of the reasons for his downfall, because uh, Stalin was able to uh, utilize uh, Russian nationalism to uh, monopolize power, and eventually assassinate Trotsky, you know, who got in his way. So. Both Marx and Trotsky were mistaken in that respect, and, and Marx was very uh, overt about, you know, his assimilationism. He wrote a pamphlet in 1848 called On the Jewish Question, which is not even a question as far as I'm concerned, in which he called for assimilation in order for the Jewish people to be liberated. And in fact, he was himself raised in a Lutheran household because his parents, who were Jewish, converted to being Lutheran in order to facilitate his mobility, his upward mobility. And uh, probably it did help him, you know, to get his uh, university PhD. But at the cost of his own culture and his own, you know, religious beliefs, you know, it's, uh, that's not uh, justifiable. What would you say about political correctness? Can you talk a little bit about cultural Marxism and the connection between cultural Marxism and political correctness and how it's going astray today? Well, political correctness is, is sort of a, a populist uh, conception of uh, what uh, you know, revolutionary theory should be about. When one talks about uh, historical progression and, and talks about uh, the advances to be made in terms of uh, social cohesion and societal uh, construction by means of constituent assembly, etc., uh, the uh, cruder forms of uh, such expressions are to be found in uh, various uh, cliches. Cliches are the big thing, you know, like people sort of learn more so from osmosis than they do from reading books. So they learn, oh, it's correct to say this, but not correct to say that. And then that's what they do. They follow that, but they don't know why. Or maybe if they choose to think about it further, they can, you know, find out a little bit, you know, why that's correct, but they don't really know the deeper meaning, you know, of the terms that they're using. So like the term race used to be a term that was considered to be a scientific term. And, uh, the, the, what is called race is actually a misnomer and is actually a name for what are known in sociology as national uh, identities. So culture is fundamental, you know, to humans and has been called race, but it is not a uh, biological race at all. And uh, what we see in terms of, you know, biological differences in terms of color and size of whatever, you know, is actually uh, a certain uh, genetic heritage that we get from various uh, areas of the world like I'm half Semitic, 
because the Ashkenazi Jewish population is composed of all those descendants of uh, Jewish traders and slaves who were brought to Rome, who intermarried with uh, European women who converted to being Jewish. And so, you know, the Ashkenazi uh, uh, Jewish people are called Ashkenazi because in Hebrew, Ashkenazi means German. So we are the uh, German Jews. And uh, that's why we speak Yiddish. And my Yiddish, you know, which is my first language, my Yiddish is a German dialect, and I can understand German as a result. <laughs> so, Have you done your DNA testing yet? No. Would you be interested to find out what your uh, genetic test told you about your ethnic heritage or no? Well, I, I, I know pretty well because my parents and uh, all their uh, ancestors, you know, were Orthodox Jewish, which meant that uh, they uh, didn't mix uh, other than with the original sort of uh, the Jewish uh, residents in Rome, uh, mixing with uh, European women. We have uh, you know, a Semitic background and uh, the Semitic background, you know, originally comes, you know, with the heritage brought by Abraham from where? From Mesopotamia. And where is that? Iraq, <laughs> from the city of Ur in the province of Sumeria. That's why I'm named Abraham, because I was named after my grandfather, who was named after his grandfather, etc., all the way back to the original Abraham. And of course, Abraham, first son is Ishmael, who became the father of the Arab nations. So all the Arabs are uh, as Semitic as uh, the Jewish people are. Can I ask you a couple of cultural questions about Judaism in general? Sure, yeah. Uh, first of all, humor. Why are Jews funny? Because the Jews are oppressed. And so in order to rebel, humor is a form of uh, rebellion against oppression. So if you can laugh, that means that you are surviving, that you're doing well at that moment, and that uh, you don't care about being oppressed at that moment, that everything's okay, that you are going to be okay and that you, you will survive and things will get better. I have another question for you. What is it about Jews and money? Why do they have the reputation of liking money, being good with money, being smart with money? Well, it's a matter of survival. You see, because, well, first of all, Jews became very expert in import-export and in banking because Jewish people could communicate on an international basis by using the Hebrew language because they had a common language. Okay, and in Europe, you know, Yiddish was a common language in which Jewish people could uh, communicate, you know, from one country to another. So they were able to make exchanges of one sort or another in terms of either, you know, loans or um, goods, you know, for import-export in, in an easy way. And also the, uh, the people of each of their countries became dependent upon them for the import-export and for the banking services because they themselves were not able to engage in such international commerce. So the Jews were uh, expert in international relations uh, in, in economic terms. And so this became a basis for uh, the anti-Semitic theory that the Jewish people controlled, you know, the world economy, which is a wild exaggeration, to say the least. If you look at the Forbes top 500 wealthiest people in the world, you'll find about eight Jewish people. And uh, amongst those, you'll find uh, Zuckerberg and uh, Soros, who are uh, billionaires, yes, but they're not pro-Zionist. So the uh, pro-Zionist lobby is certainly not a, a dominant affair. It is a lobby, but... Uh, subject to the uh, much greater forces that are uh, prevalent in the world, like the military-industrial complex of the United States. Can you talk a little bit about Islam, the religion? Islam is a very progressive religion. If one wants to talk about a Judeo-Christian tradition, it is to be found in Islam, but it is not to be found in Christianity. Christianity has dissociated itself from Judaism and has uh, recreated the notions of uh, heaven and hell, and also the notions of the demigod, you know, as Hercules in the Greek mythology, in which uh, the word, the Greek word Christ has been used and applied to uh, Yehoshua ben Yaakov, who is called Jesus Christ in Christian theology. So the differences between Judaism and Christianity were exaggerated by the various forms of Christianity, even though Protestantism sought to reunify with Judaism by translating the uh, Torah as a text of Christianity, which was a progressive step. But Islam has adopted all the books of Judaism and Christianity to become a religion which does not follow a national identity alone, which does not follow an exclusive religious identity alone, but rather is an inclusive religion that welcomes others to join in it, and uh, only became uh, militaristic and, and uh, expansionist uh, with the uh, Berber uh, nations who became converted to Islam in North Africa 
and expanded to include uh, Spain as well, which then came into conflict, you know, with the countervailing Christian Crusades, which uh, reconquered Spain and then went on to uh, seek to uh, conquer uh, the Holy Land as well. But Islam has sought to achieve a historical advance on the previous religious expressions, and I respect Islam for that reason. And it is, uh, generally speaking, a peaceful religion. But when confronted with a crusade, it has provisions for resistance. And what we have had happen since the First World War was the British reconquest of Jerusalem. And when General Allenby walked into Jerusalem, his famous words were, this is the last crusade. That is exactly what we have, you know, is the conflict, you know, in Jerusalem nowadays between Islam and uh, the uh, Zionist Christian motif. The, the Balfour Declaration, the General Allenby, and then later the uh, occupation of Palestine by the Zionist militias. All are a uh, trilogy of events, you know, which are all related to each other. And uh, is uh, provoked, you know, the Al-Aqsa Intifada, which is the um, Intifada that's uh, continuing now, and uh, which is represented more so by Hamas, which claims the, uh, the rights of Islam in Jerusalem uh, which is denied by the uh, Zionist government, you know, with the uh, the more uh, extreme right-wing political parties which want exclusive control over the Temple Mount, as it's called, which is now the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque. So it's a very, uh, you know, uh, interesting and dangerous time that we are living in. Okay. And what about the level of atheism or agnosticism in Jerusalem? It's estimated that 20% of the Jewish people are religious only 20%. However, in Israel, it's 38%. And in Jerusalem, it's about 50%. Very high dominance of Hasidim, who are not Zionists, who refuse military service. He even refused to vote in Israel's elections. So when you look into it, you know, it's much more complex than it's uh, portrayed to be, you know, by the Zionist spokespersons. The Christians and Muslims in Jerusalem, are they highly religious? And in Nablus, you know, like 99% of the population are Muslim, and, and strictly Muslim. 99% or more of the women, even the young women, uh, wear the uh, hijab, you know, the, the hair covering. And, and, I mean, they can be, you know, like uh, as progressive as, as, as anybody else, you know, leftists and everything like that, but they'll still be wearing a hijab because it's a cultural identity, and they maintain Islam as a cultural identity as well. And it's also, Islam provides the Palestinians with a sense of uh, perspective and hope in terms of overcoming the military occupation. So Islam plays this role uh, that uh, politics has not been able to fulfill. Politics has been a disappointment. And the Palestinians uh, are very uh, critical of the Palestinian Authority, which has been uh, supervising the occupation in conjunction with, the, uh, with the Israel's uh, military. So Islam has replaced politics as a belief system and as a uh, life perspective. What about ISIS and all those extreme terrorist forms of Islam? Can you just talk in very general terms, because I don't understand any of that. Um, just sort of explain it to me. How does that fit in between politics and religion? Where does it lie? The Daesh or ISIS or the Islamic Caliphate or the Islamic State is, uh, has its foundation in Islam as well. When one talks about a jihad against the uh, occupation or against the crusade, it resembles what is being called jihad by the uh, Daesh uh, movement. Only they are using it in a very sectarian way to oppose uh, anybody who is not a, a believer in their own uh, belief system. So it becomes an exclusivist you know, uh, project, much like the uh, Berber Islamist uh, expansionist uh, tendency that took place that took over Spain at one point. But one has to take note that this jihadist extremism, for the most part, took place within the countries that were under occupation, like Afghanistan, uh, which used to be under Russian communist uh, occupation when the Mujahideen were being supported by the CIA to expel the uh, Russian occupation, then became you know uh, the uh, Al Qaeda formation against uh, the uh, uh, American occupation of, of Afghanistan uh, thereafter. Then uh, the uh, jihadist, you know, uh, Mujahideen Taliban, uh, which uh, took over from that, 
and but they were always within their own countries. What the Ash did is became an international jihad against the Western military occupations of Oriental countries. So that was a one step up. Now uh, the Daesh expanded into terrorist operations against civilians within the Western countries. And so taking the offensive against the Western countries, much like the Western countries took the offensive against the Islamic countries uh, by uh, military occupation. So, I mean, for the jihadists of the uh, Daesh kind, it's easy for them to justify what they are doing because they are merely doing what the Western crusaders are doing to a lesser degree. So it's easy for them to justify that, even though they are violating the precepts of Islam, which are pacifist and uh, respect, you know, life, uh, you know, of all sorts. So it's something that uh, need not be, but is at the present time, until there will be uh, no more military occupation of uh, Islamic, you know, cultures and uh, and the territories in which they live. So it's a geopolitical question as well. So this is a sort of a strange question for you, but what's your favorite religion? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I have an affinity for my Judaism, but I also have uh, much respect for Islam. But Christianity scares the hell out of me because I'm a second generation Holocaust survivor. It's part of my post-traumatic stress disorder. But uh, if, if that's what you want to, to practice, you know, then that's okay with me, you know, <laughs> then no big deal. Uh, I wonder if you are a harbinger of a tendency in the Catholic religious culture that will bring about revolutionary change within that particular religious culture. Now we see indications of this in two phenomena. One, in the Catholic uh, Latin American uh, tradition of liberation theology, and then secondly in the uh, current Pope who has a certain uh, affinity to presenting himself as a progressive figure. So I think that um, you are perhaps part of a, a greater tendency which will have a, an interesting effect and uh, create a, uh, a change which will uh, overcome many of the faults in that religious culture that were perpetuated previously. I don't consider myself a progressive, but can you define the term? A progressive would be somebody who would uh, agree to uh, live and let live, you know, and that uh, they wish to uh, live in their own fashion, in with their own culture, their own religion, but they don't um, find it abhorrent that uh, other people will live in other religious tendencies, unlike the new Bill 62, you know, of the Quebec legislature, which uh, doesn't consider it to be uh, acceptable that uh, somebody uh, else will choose to display their uh, differing uh, religious culture. According to your definition, I'm definitely a progressive, Whenever I see a Hasidic Jew in my land with their characteristic garb, or whenever I see a Muslim woman with a hijab, I love it. I, I want to see more of that. Frankly, I want more modesty in dress in general for Christian women because I find that they're showing too much skin. I, I find that it's attractive to look at a woman's breasts when she's exposing them. And I don't want that because I'm already happily married. I don't want to see every woman's breasts, right? even though they're beautiful, but I don't want that temptation. So I prefer to see a Muslim woman that I know that she is very modest in public anyway. And what comes to mind when I see a Muslim woman is God Almighty. But when I see a Christian woman with her breasts hanging out, I think about sex. Yes. The uh, Protestant individualism it has been translated by Protestant women to be an affirmation of their own sexuality because they know the power of their own sexuality and they want to use this power for their own individual uh, reasons. But at the same time that the Christian Protestant, you know, political culture allows for uh, the women to display themselves, you know, in a prideful manner, at the same time, they reject the attention which it creates in, the, in their bodies as well. So, you know, uh, it's, it's hypocritical in a way, you know, and modesty can be a very uh, attractive feature. You know, when I'm speaking with Muslim women and, I, and I'm looking at their face and concentrating on their eyes and their mouth when they are speaking, I have a much higher degree of uh, communication with the women. And I'm com communicating with the Muslim women as people and not just as a woman. Now, those Muslim women who don't want to communicate, don't want to expose themselves to being looked at, so they wear a veil. 
okay. The real reason, you know, for the, uh, uh, you know, suppression of a face veil is because it is a uh, Christian uh, dress code that is being imposed on the population in general. And also in the uh, National Assembly, we have Christian cross, which is being imposed uh, on the National Assembly as well, which is still hanging there. And even here in, in the Montreal, on top of the mountain, we have a Christian cross, which is uh, being held for all to look up at and uh, consider to be the character of the city. So I object to all of these uh, religious manifestations. So the, the cross in the National Assembly should be removed. Okay. So I'd like to end on a positive note. So just to wrap up the interview, what would you say to anyone that's out there listening now? Well, humans are a social animal and humans like to be in the company of other humans. And humans love other humans. The basic tendency is for humans to love one another. The reason why there is alienation in society is because of an imposition that is contrary to the natural tendency of human nature. Now, to be happier, one should become conscious of the factors that are being imposed upon one's life that are contrary to one's human nature. Once one becomes conscious of these contrary tendencies and impositions, one can overcome them with one's own consciousness and therefore overcome the fears that one has, the neuroses that one has, and be able to approach other people in a social manner that will open up a whole avenue of life that one didn't think was possible previously. If you like your worldview, if you think it's swell, if you've got some questions, ask me and I'll tell. All you've got to do is ask. All you've got to do is ask.